Hello everybody, uh, welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. This is uh, specialised vocabulary in English for academic purposes in research and teaching presented by Avril Coxhead. I'm Simon Wright from Cambridge University Press and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleagues Eve Lloyd and Sarah Stokes. This webinar is actually the penultimate webinar in our academic series that's been uh, running all week. There's still one more talk after this one, which starts in about an hour's time, so uh, please do try and sign up for that one as well. Uh, if you visit Cambridge slash academic hyphen English, and then you can see a box um, that advertises the conference where you can go in and register. During the webinar today, you'll be able to hear our speaker and see her slides, but you won't be able to see Avril herself. You won't need a microphone. And if you want to ask a question, please, could you enter the question into the chat box and uh, I can put the questions to Avril at the end of the session. The recording of today's webinar will be on our conference uh, registration page where you registered. We shall be putting a watch again link to, the, to that in about a week's time. So please do visit that page again um, and then you'll be able to, uh, to see this again or see any of the other talks that you've missed. Now, there's been um, uh, a bit of uh, chatter about certificates in previous sessions. Certificate, um, I'm very sorry about that. We have uh, changed the settings on it, which will allow you to now enter your name into the certificate at the end. This is a certificate of attendance, I should point out. Um, so at the end of the webinar, please, uh, you'll see the link to, to download that. Please click on that and then you can just enter your name in and you can print that, that out. Then you have a certificate of attendance. Um, if you have uh, visited any of the previous sessions, then we'll be emailing this certificate out anyway, so you, you will get it. Okay, let me just uh, give you just a brief bit of background to today's presenter. Associate Professor Avril Coxhead is the Learning, Teaching and Equity Director in the School of Linguistics and Applied Language Studies at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Avril teaches undergraduate TESOL and MA courses in vocabulary and EAP. She is the author of Vocabulary and ESP Research, uh, Routledge 2018, and the co-author of Academic Vocabulary for Middle School Students, Research-Based Lists and Strategies for Key Content Areas, Brooks, that's 2015. So over to you. So kia ora kato. Kato, it's Avril Coxhead here from Victoria University of Wellington. Thank you for that introduction, Simon. I'm hopeful that you can all hear me, and I'm also hopeful that you don't mind a New Zealand accent coming at you over the airwaves. I'm going to talk very briefly to start with, because it can be quite unusual for people to hear a New Zealander speaking, so I just want to get you, get, get you used to my accent. So I'm a New Zealander, as you can hear. I've been a language teacher for many years, and, uh, and I've been working at Victoria University Wellington now for quite a long time as well, which is great, it's good fun. So as Simon said, I'm gonna be talking about specialized vocabulary in English for EAP. And today's talk is really centered around three main ideas. Oh, there's me, by the way. So, so specialized vocabulary in EAP in research and teaching. My voice may be high, so I need me, you need me to go a little bit lower. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about three main ideas. Firstly, the nature of specialised vocabulary. Secondly, I want to talk a bit about word lists, which is something that uh, I, I work on in EAP as well as English for specific purposes, as Simon said. And then uh, I want to talk a bit about planning for vocabulary in EAP classrooms and in our curriculum. So what I wanted to start with is an idea around vocabulary in general. And I think that this is a really important quote from Jim Milton, who comes from, uh, he's at Swansea University in the UK. And he says very si simply, building a large vocabulary of several thousand words appears to be an absolute condition of being able to function well in a foreign language. Now for general purposes, several thousand words really is probably enough. So the research into general English use 
suggest that we just need two to three thousand words, for example, for spoken general English. But what happens with English for academic purposes? And that's really what we want to talk about today. Now, we've done some research in English in, in foreign language contexts, and that research suggests that there's quite low levels of vocabulary knowledge in English for secondary school and early university students. For example, in Germany, and that's a paper that I've just published, it's now published in TESOL quarterly, and that was a study done in uh, schools where you've got stu students in, in an English medium instruction context, they're going to an international school, and what we found in that research is that the students who are coming into high school, even though they'd had quite a few years of instruction in English, they really didn't have a particularly good vocabulary. So we've got the same sort of findings in Denmark, and we've got the same sorts of findings going on in Taiwan. So one of the key things I wanted to talk about with my title around research and teaching is I think it's really important that we get more of an idea into about vocab people's vocabulary knowledge, because unless we know roughly how many words our learners know, then how can we decide what we need to be doing in our classrooms and decide what we're going to do as a teaching group, for example. And we need this information for general English speakers, but we also, I mean, general English learning, but we also need it for English for academic purposes. And I'll get onto that in a minute. So there's a key question really here, which is how many and what kinds of words do your learners know in English? So, when we, get, when we look at that question, I think that that's fundamental knowledge that a language teacher should have about the, the students who are in our classes. And it's not an unrealistic thing to find out anymore. So we can find out, for example, by uh, getting learners to take the updated vocabulary levels test, which is um, it, it, it's available on a website that you can find, I'm sure. It's also probably on the Lexical Tutor website. And the updated levels test tests people's knowledge of the first thousand, second thousand, third thousand, fourth thousand, and fifth thousand levels of, of English. Now, what it doesn't do is test academic vocabulary. And I think what we're finding is that there are more and more examples of tests for academic vocabulary coming through in the research. If you want to find some uh, locally made tests, for the academic word list, then you could take a look on my Victoria University of Wellington website. Just Google my name. It's a very unusual name and you should be able to find me. Um, and you can find a couple of tests there with answers there. So I've talked about an updated vocabulary levels test. You've got academic word list tests on my website that you might be able to use. There are new tests coming through in the research. And you also might want to take a look at the vocabulary size test which gives people an overall um, estimate of how many words they uh, recognize in English. Now, one of, these th one of the things that it really depends on is how much learners know what sort of background knowledge they've got of a particular subject when it comes to EAP. So if we think about students who are, for example, they're going to be going to study commerce or business at university, if they have a background, say they have a family, that um, has, has run businesses, they have an understanding, you know, mum's an accountant or dad's worked in advertising or any of those sorts of environments where they've got some sort of background knowledge. Clearly those students are going to do better in knowing the, the technical or specialised vocabulary of the field than somebody who hasn't been um, exposed at all to any of those ideas. So that's something else to have a think about. Now I'm going to give you a task and what you'll see is four lists here. You've got two things to think about. What subject area do the words in the table come from, do you think? And then how do you know? So I'm going to let you have a chat and I'm going to give you a minute to have a think about that starting now. Yeah, these are good guesses. Keep going, folks. Keep going. Yeah, we can see law, medicine. Each list is different. Yes, that's right. 
Yeah, you're doing well. You're doing really well. So what I'm what I'm trying to show you here is examples of words which are considered to be technical according to different subject areas. And what you might have noticed that in list three, for example, you've got words like bar. Now bar here doesn't mean a place where you might go and, and have a quiet drink after work if you live in a context where that's normal. Um, you see the word excuse, but that might not, not be the same sorts of meaning. So what we've got here is specialized vocabulary. So this isn't general English, although some of these words do have, um, they are used in general English, but they also use for specific purposes as well. Now I'm going to show you the guess, see, see where the, we're just going to check your guesses here. So the first lot was plumbing, and that's from a word list that I've made recently with, uh, with a colleague of mine. And, the, uh, and one of the things that you'll notice about those plumbing words, for example, is that if you don't know much about plumbing, you certainly won't recognize many of those words. The second one is a really interesting list that comes from architecture. And this key point that I want to make there is you see words like crack, for example, uh, measure and stress. Stress here doesn't really mean stress that we might feel from being language teachers, but it's really about the stress that's related to a building. But I think that there's a core meaning there. Now take a look in the, the third one. That's really interesting because that was a study that looked at the question of if we're teaching law with English language speakers, if we get them to watch legal movies and TV programs, will they encounter the technical vocabulary of that field? And what these researchers found is that, yes, there was some uh, technical vocabulary in there, but not much. And it depends on what's happening in the action sequences. So if there's a romantic part, then there's not going to be much technical vocabulary. The final example is from the middle school health vocabulary list. And that was developed by Jennifer Green with my input uh, in the middle school lists, which, which are also available uh, through Brooks. The reason why I wanted to talk about these words is that I see them as being examples of, uh, we, we would say, technical vocabulary in, in plumbing, for example, or specialized vocabulary connected to very closely to the subject area. Yeah. So one of the key things to think about there is you can see that the more a learner knows about that subject area, the more likely it is that they will also know these words. Also, we can see that there are um, words that are in general English, but they're also being used very specifically. So this is a very tricky thing about specialized vocabulary. Now, I wanted to talk a bit more about the nature. Oh, hello. So, my, so sorry, I had a couple of questions. So did you, do you know these words? Because sometimes I look at these words and think, I don't actually know what they are. For example, in plumbing, Desludged doesn't sound very nice, does it? But anyway, so it just you might not know the word lintel is another example. And then why would you not know them? Well, maybe you haven't been exposed to these words. Maybe you don't need them in your everyday life. And then would your learners know them is another good question. And then do they need to know them? And that's really a particularly good point. Because we have to be very careful about making sure in vocabulary programs that we're not just teaching them stuff that they already actually know. Okay, I want to move on really quickly now to talk a bit more about the nature of specialized vocabulary. So in EAP, you'll often see these two basic varieties, general academic vocabulary and discipline-specific vocabulary. And just recently, Ken Highland, who's an expert in English for academic purposes, he's talked about these two kinds of vocabulary as actually being related to each other in terms of being on some sort of a climb. So in other words, general academic vocabulary is common to uh, most areas, and then discipline specific is towards the other end where we get people much more specific. What else? We find that academic vocabulary can make up a substantial proportion of written and spoken academic texts. Oh, when I mean no, I'm talking usually about recognition, depends on whether it's writing or in speaking. So there are um, academic word lists, for example, that can make up between, I don't know, 10% to 16% of written text. Just recently, we've been looking more in spoken academic English, and I'll tell you a little bit about that again in a minute. But it looks like um, some of the research is becoming much clearer about the nature of vocabulary in these academic texts. We've still got people saying hello. It's really friendly. Okay, it's good. 
Um, Paul Nation says, and I'm lucky enough to have him here with me in Wellington in New Zealand, um, he says that one, that one feature of academic vocabulary or specialised vocabulary is that it can be high frequency, mid frequency or low frequency words. So we need to think about that because when I created the academic word list, for example, I made an assumption that learners who were going to be studying for university level study should probably already know the first 2,000 words of English. So I excluded those words from my research. The problem with that is, well, there are two. One is we know now from our vocabulary knowledge studies that actually learners don't know as many words as we think, which is a problem. And then the second thing is that there are academic words in the first 2,000 words of English. So this new academic vocabulary list, which was developed by Gardner and Davies, takes into account those more high-frequency words. All right. Now, we also know that specialised vocabulary is made up of single words, but also of multi-word units. And I will talk a little bit more about those soon, because there are lists of multi-word units which you might want to take a look at. Um, so we, we're not just thinking about single words, but it's words in context and how words that um, appear together could be making up a new meaning. So some of the work that I'm doing in the trades, for example, at the moment, I had plumbers telling me, well, look, uh, angle is not really a technical word, but 90 degree angle together, yes, that's absolutely technical. So for me, this is a field of research. Now, one other really good point to make about specialised vocabulary is that, is that learners won't necessarily encounter this vocabulary in their everyday lives. So uh, David Corson, may he rest in peace, he was an Australian who moved to Canada and did a lot of good work there and looking at academic vocabulary. He says that if learners don't encounter this language, there's a lexical bar that happens. So if you don't, uh, if you don't have preparation of talking about academic ideas and reading academic texts, then you're going to be at a disadvantage, and that disadvantage gets greater and greater and greater. Don't worry about being that late. We're very happy to have you here. Okay. Another feature is that. Academic vocabulary includes Greco-Latin words, many, many of them. So the academic word list is made up of, of about 80% Greco-Latin words. Now, if you're a speaker of Russian or Romanian or French or Italian, for you, the academic word list words, which are Greco-Latin in, in origin, those ones are not going to be such a challenge for you. But if you are uh, somebody who comes from a language that that, that is not a with English, then those words are going to be more problematic. So I think it's really important to look, for example, at learning word parts. There's the new word parts test, which have been developed by Yosuke Sasao, and you can find his website. So you can find out which word parts um, your learners know. And you can find there as well examples of how you could work with word parts to deal with those common Greco Latin words. Okay, now. I'm going to move a bit faster. Oh, that's not working. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the more there are some more things to think about. So we have to think about vocabulary as well as learners' identity. So where do they see themselves? And, and do they see themselves as people who are joining an academic community, or do they see themselves doing something else? Would they, would they really rather be doing something else than studying for academic purposes? How much content knowledge do they have? Um, if they don't have much, then they're really going to have to be building their knowledge in that field as well as developing their language skills. Um, we need to think about output. So how much writing and how much speaking are they doing? If learners are not doing much academic writing and academic speaking, then we're really going to be in trouble. And of course, they need to, you need to be thinking about input. I really worry about EAP courses where students are writing very short pieces of work or they're reading very short pieces of writing. Re reading very short pieces of text. Academic reading and writing is not like that at all. Okay, so how big is a specialised vocabulary? Well, that's that's a really good question, and actually we don't really know the answer. And there's a reason for that. So it depends, right? It depends what the learners already know about the subject. So somebody who knows a lot will has a big advantage over somebody who doesn't really know very much about the subject area. Another thing we need to know is how big is their general English vocabulary already. Now, one of the things that we did with the with the sorry, one of the things we did with the 
spoken academic word list is uh, Yen Dang, who developed the list, and we worked with her. The idea with that list was to make it so that different learners with different levels of proficiency could work with different parts of the t of the word list. So, in other words, there's a <clears throat> if you have a learner who comes in and they already have a good knowledge of the first thousand words, then um, you can and you can you know that they have a good knowledge of the first thousand words. Then we direct their attention to a the um, to the a next bit of the t a bit. No, sorry, if they already know the first thousand words, for example, then we direct them to a particular part of the academic spoken word list. If they don't know the first thousand words, then we direct them to another part of the academic spoken word list. So it's really put into levels according to learner knowledge. Now, if you want to know about technical vocabulary, Chung and Nation found that 30% of an anatomy text and 20% of an applied linguistics text is, uh, were technical in nature. And the work that I've been doing recently in the trade shows between 30 and 40% of a written text is technical. That's a huge percentage. Now, I can see people are asking questions about what happens if you don't know much about the subject matter. My, my main point that I want to say with that is that I think it's everybody's responsibility to develop language skills of their students. So if you, you need to work as closely as content teachers if you're able to. Level 1 students, I don't know what you mean by that. Okay, I'm going to keep going to talk about responses to finding out about specialised vocabulary. So one is to make word lists. That's pretty obvious. And usually now we're using a corpus or even two. And we're looking at single or multi-word units, but we need to be really careful as teachers to look at how they were made. What was the purpose of this list? Who were they made for? And what were the purposes? And then we need to think about what do your learners already know? So there's no point, as I've said, teaching them stuff that they don't know already. We need to also be thinking about how the lists relate to content in classes. I often get told this, word lists are just a list of words. Well, that's true. So what I was thinking about when I developed academic, the academic word list and other word lists is how do I make a tool that learners and teachers can work with easily in relation to the work that they're doing with academic text and with their own writing. So school level text, ah, lists, sorry. So you've got Green and Lambert's new secondary vocabulary list. If we've got anybody here from Singapore, you might want to know about those lists as well. Uh, they've just come out. And I've already mentioned the middle school vocabulary lists by Green and Cox said they're very easy to track down as well. And if you know about the Complete Lexical Tutor, then you can go to the Complete Lexical Tutor website, you can put in your text, and you can analyse the text according to the words from the academic word list, and you can also analyse them according to the middle school vocabulary lists. And those lists are um, health, science, maths, can't remember and something else, or English language and uh, writing, and there's one more that I can't remember right now. Oh, social studies, I remember now. Okay, now if you're interested in general EAP, I've already talked about the academic word list. We've got the new academic vocabulary list, and that's very easy to find on a website, which is www.academicvocabulary.info. I'll put that link up for you in a minute. And <clears throat> if you want to know about the spoken academic word list, you can find that on my website, and there's a link to the article you can find as well. Thank goodness for the internet. We do have discipline-specific purposes lists, and I've put a couple of examples. Uh, medical students in Taiwan, there's, a, there's an example there. We've got more medical word lists. What we find in word lists is medicine and engineering are well served, but <clears throat> there aren't so many in different areas. We've got a new one by Ha and Highland in finance. If you want to follow that one up, you can look at the work by Ken Highland. I'll put that up as well. Finance. Okay. Ha and and that's based in Hong Kong. Okay. Now we do have some multi-word unit lists as well. Simpson, Black and Alice have a list of academic formulas. So this is done uh, with 200 common spoken academic formulas, 200 common written academic formulas, and then we've got 
200 that are shared between both written and speaking. And I've just shown you there some other examples. Mike Nelson has a web page about business lists, and you've got the academic collocations list, and then Liu's work as well on general academic formulae, including lexical bundles and idioms. So we're going to start running out of time. I will put the links in there, I promise you, about that. So what happens when we think about what we need to do with our planning for this kind of language? Now, Paul Nation talks about the jobs of a vocabulary teacher, and he says first job is planning, second job is testing, third job is teaching strategies, and the fourth job is teaching. I think that's pretty interesting because often people think that teaching is the first job of a teacher. Now, Paul Nation puts forward four strands of a, of a vocabulary course, and I really wanted to present them here today because we have to think about this in our EAP courses. So Paul says we need four strands of a course and that they should all have 25% of the time each. So if we think about the first strand, it's meaning-focused input. Now, meaning here doesn't mean the meaning of vocabulary. It means that our learners are learning through reading and through listening. Then the next strand is meaning-focused output, where they're doing writing and speaking. Now, if you think about your, your EAP courses and have a good think about how much time learners are spending on input, how much time are they spending on output, I think you, you, you might be a bit surprised about um, how out of balance courses might be. Now, language focused learning is the third strand, and what that's about is deliberate learning of vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, four strands. Sorry about that. So, language focused learning, deliberate focus on vocabulary strategies like learning through word cards, which is old technology, but it's very, very important uh, and it's a highly effective strategy. The last strand is fluency development, and it often just gets uh, missed out. <clears throat> so the problem with fluency, I think, is that we're constantly focusing our learners on new stuff without practicing the old stuff. And the, the important thing about practicing the old stuff is that learners need to get fluent with the use of this vocabulary. If they don't become fluent with it, then they either won't use it and they'll lose it, or they, they won't um, uh, be able to build long-term memory of these of these words. Now, if we're planning for assessment, we have to be thinking about if you're, if you're focusing on vocabulary in particular, then I think it's really important to think about is this being assessed in any way? So do you want to have your assessment of vocabulary to be little and often, so therefore low pressure, so you keep going, it's a constant thing that happens for learners and you are aware and they are aware that you're building knowledge, sorry, building knowledge of vocabulary? And then we need to think about what aspects of knowledge we're focused on. So meaning is always going to be the first one, right? Because if you don't know the meaning, then you really don't know the word. And then the form of the word is another important aspect of it. And the final one, and this is a formation framework, is to think about use. So that's what kinds of words go with this word. What are the common collocations? What are the common patterns? What are the grammatical patterns? Okay. Another thing about the assessments is to let them know what it is and when and why you're doing it. That's very common. And then reflecting on the assessment and learning from it as much as possible. Now, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, I think, so I'm just going to keep going a bit more quickly. So when we think about strategies, we need to be thinking about learning words quickly. Word cards is enormously effective for that. We need to think about strategies for working with words and reading. Now, I often see getting meaning from context as being a, a strategy, but the problem is, it's really a reading strategy it's that needs to be followed up by vocabulary learning. We need to make sure that we avoid words that look or sound the same or are opposites. Now, a very simple example is uh, in Hungarian. I had a Hungarian teacher and she told me the words for hot and cold. And she told me that uh, one word was hideg and the other word was malag. And I'll put these words here. Hideg and then malag. And the problem is she told me that those words were opposites and she told them to me at the same time and she didn't tell me which ones were which and I got very confused with those words and and so I had to focus on one. We have to be very careful when we teach opposites, we have to be very careful when we teach words that look the same. We need our learners to also keep track of vocabulary so it's not just a forgotten thing, you know, one, one day you focus on it, the next day it's gone. That's the way that we um, if we don't revisit these words and think about them and keep track of them, then we lose them, right? The most effective thing I've ever done as a teacher is had a vocabulary box. It's very simple. 
you get a shoe box. Oh, first thing you have to buy some shoes. Second thing, get a shoe. You get the shoe box. You get um, word cards. So you have it at the end of every lesson, and all the words that have come up. You get the students to write word cards with the word on the front and in English, and an example sentence on the back. If you've got multilingual classes or a translation, and then all the words go into the box. And in my experience, after a 12-week course, we usually have between 700 and 800 words in the box. And um, what I find is that the learners will be able to say, I, I'd say, oh, what about this word? They say, no, no, it's in the box. And by the end of the course, where they've all been working with these words, you know it's a really successful strategy because somebody usually steals all the word cards out of the box on the last day. Now, learners need many, many encounters with words. It's not the first encounter that's going to be the important one. So we need to we need between 8 to 16 repetitions and early repetitions early on, but we also need space retrieval. Okay, which means we have to get our learners to be thinking about um, the meaning of the word and retrieving it in their memory without being able to see the word at the same time. Now, to recap, it's actually question time, folks. That's gone very, very quickly. But the main things I wanted to talk about today was more information about the nature of specialised vocabulary, about word lists for vocabulary, and then planning for vocabulary. So those are the main things now. Overall, thank so you very much for that. Recap. That's excellent. I think it's pretty clear that we need to have you back and do something uh, a bit longer or <laughs> something different. That was that was really good. We've got a number of questions coming through here. Uh, let's have a look. Two of them were very similar. Okay. Um, how can we in, uh, integrate vocabulary when we have a limited time or the material doesn't include any explicit vocabulary activities? And it's similar to how can we make specialised vocabulary um, activities? Okay, so I think the, the key point to respond with is the four strands. So ensuring that your vocabulary programme has uh, large amounts of input, large amounts of output in, in writing and in speaking, that you've got deliberate learning taking place as well, and that you've got fluency development. So if you have materials that don't, uh, that are just reading, but there's not much listening, okay, so what can you do about that? Uh, if you have a lot of deliberate learning of, of words, you need to be looking at those deliberate learning activities to say, well, are they building enough repetitions here? Can I use word cards? Are there other techniques that I can use? Or are the deliberate learning activities really taking over? And okay, lovely. Another quick question. Is it, true that we need, is it true that we need to recycle vocabulary at least four times for our brains to retain it? Is it maybe retention techniques of vocabulary? Yeah, we need more. One of the reasons why word cards works, for example, is that when learners are looking at one side, so they're looking at the target word, they can't see the other side. So they have to return, they have to retrieve the meaning of the word without seeing it on the other side of the card. That's called space retrieval. So research tells us that if we have lots of retrieval early on with new words, so lots of practice with trying to remember something and bringing that memory to bear, so looking at the form, trying to remember the meaning, looking at the word in the, in the second language and trying to remember the first language. If we do lots of that stuff, then it makes it much, much easier to, um, to develop those very quick pathways in the brain. So lots and lots of space retrieval is what's really important. How many? It depends on what people already know, but I would say between 8 and 16 alone. I think all learners need to know that. We should tell them it's very important that they not understand that if they're constantly trying to learn something new, actually they really need to go back and make sure the other the, the stuff they already know is well and truly established in their memory. Very good. As well, as we'll just end on one point from. Yes, uh, Hungarian is a fabulous language. I'll just end on. I think we're, we're over. <laughs> don't yeah, mind because it's it's a, a great topic. This, but just finish on a point from Lucy. She says, um, "I ask my students to collect uh, their own vocabulary." Um, and then write a crazy story with all the words. I think that's quite a nice thing because A, they remember it and B, it's fun. They're using it, yeah. Now, there, there is somebody who's asked about TED Talks. I've just published a book about using TED Talks in the classroom and I can put that reference up as well. 
And I've done some work on TED Talks if you're interested. And actually, TED Talks are a lot more like written language than spoken language. Uh, but I can I can put a reference up of a paper, or you can. Try and it you on can my do website. that as well. Yeah, let's just get a message. Thanks a lot, everybody.